to say welcome once again. And this morning, we have the honor of hearing from Dr. Miranda Cruz. She holds many titles, including wife, mother, author, professor. She loves the Lord deeply, and it's really evident if you've spent any time with her. Um, I was blessed to have Dr. Cruz, it's very hard to call you Miranda, Dr. Cruz as a professor for both undergrad and seminary, and she has been a blessing to my life and to many, many, many others. And so we are also blessed to have her and her wonderful family as a part of our Waterline Biblical community. And so if you would, would you put your hands together and welcome Dr. Miranda Cruz. Good morning. Uh, Pastor Laura is too kind. She had me in class um, during my first semester teaching at Indiana Wesleyan, and I had no clue what I was doing, and it showed. Um, so it's gotten better since then, I promise. Uh, but it's, it's a real joy to be with you all this morning and to have one of my former students as one of my pastors. Uh, so would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, Move in the place between speaking and hearing, that your good news may be proclaimed and your truth believed. Amen. So we're in the second week of our series, Problems and Promises, where we are discovering the faithfulness of God in the story of the Israelites of the Old Testament. And last week, Pastor Scott set up the series by connecting the promised land of the Old Testament to our own promised land of becoming more like Christ. And he connected the scarlet cord that protected Rahab and her family to the scarlet blood of Christ's sacrifice for our salvation. Today, we're continuing the story of the Israelites entering their promised land and us entering ours. What is the longest you've ever waited for something? Maybe you've spent months planning a big vacation and the day to go to the airport finally arrives, or you've been dreaming for years of starting your own business and it's finally launch day. Maybe you waited years to become parents and it's finally adoption day. Or it's your last doctor's appointment to confirm remission after a long battle with illness. Maybe it's your first day of senior year and you finally get to drive to school and be at the top of that pecking order. How long have you anticipated the fulfillment of a hope? Weeks, years, decades? Do you feel the anticipation of that big day? That stomach in knots, can't possibly sleep, can't talk about about anything else feeling? There's excitement, it's finally here, but also perhaps fear. What if everything doesn't go quite the way we've hoped for? Now, take that feeling of anticipation and multiply it by about 600 years. Wrap up your entire lifetime, your entire identity, your entire understanding of the world and your place in it into that anticipation. And that's where we find the Israelites in the book of Joshua. Absolutely everything has led to this moment on the banks of the Jordan River, just waiting for the command to enter the promised land. The story leading up to this day has been handed down from generation to generation for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the story goes like this. God appeared to Abram and told him, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. Abram obeyed God, he left his homeland, he became the father of Isaac and the grandfather of Jacob and the great-grandfather of Joseph, who became a ruler in Egypt. Then Abraham's descendants became slaves in Egypt, and after 400 years of slavery, God appeared to Moses and commanded him to lead the people out of slavery. Lead them where? 
to the land that God had promised Abraham nearly 600 years earlier. So God said to Moses, I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Moses obeyed God. He led the Israelites out of Egypt and led them as they wandered in the desert for the next 40 years. But Moses and all the people who left Egypt with him died during that 40 years. Joshua and everyone he is leading into the promised land know the story, but they didn't experience the key events for themselves. They are relying on promises made to their distant ancestors for assurance that this land really will become theirs. And they're camped out on the banks of the Jordan, trusting that God really will come through again. This is how we find the Israelites in Joshua 3. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp giving orders to the people. When the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it move, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go, since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. So look at the details of how this anticipated moment is going to play out. First, the people get right up to the edge of the river. Then they wait three days. Then, when it's time to go, they can't just go running into the promised land. They can't ford the river or build a bridge or get across by their own ingenuity at all. Instead, they have to fall in line behind the Ark of the Covenant and trust God to do something amazing to get them across the river. So let's pause there. What's with this Ark thing? So the Ark of the Covenant was basically a very important box. Back when God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, God also gave instructions for this box in which the Israelites were to keep the tablets of the law, known as the covenant. It was covered in pure gold, symbolizing the purity and holiness of God. It had two cherubim, these winged creatures, who symbolized the attendance at God's throne. So the ark represented God's physical presence with the people. They carried the ark of the covenant with them as they wandered in the desert. And when they would construct a tabernacle and eventually a temple, the ark of the covenant was the physical location where the priests would go to be in the Lord's presence. The presence of the ark was the assurance of God's presence with them. So here they are waiting to follow the ark across the Jordan River into the promised land. And they can only move when the ark moves. God's presence goes first. Can you imagine that crowd trying to catch a glimpse of the ark, just waiting for the sign that it's time to move? The Israelites are all there, ready to break camp, and Joshua explains what's going to happen. See, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Now then, choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. And as soon as the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand in a heap. Does that sound familiar? It definitely did to the Israelites. Their parents and grandparents had told them about how God parted the Red Sea so they could cross out of Egypt on dry land. Around campfires and while walking through the desert, the elders would tell the story. 
Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. But remember, the generation preparing to enter the promised land wasn't born yet when God did that. And I have to wonder whether maybe they'd started to think the story of the Red Sea crossing had been exaggerated. Did God really part the sea? Or were grandma and grandpa just spinning a yarn to entertain the kids? <laughs> now, this young generation of Israelites has their own opportunity to trust God, to miraculously lead them forward to the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. This is the moment where 600 years of anticipation will be fulfilled for a generation that trusts God's leading. Last week, Pastor Scott talked about our own promised land, which is life with Christ, living free from the power of sin. When I consider the Israelites on the banks of the Jordan, I have to ask, do we trust in Christ alone to lead us into the promised land of abundant life, the way they trusted God's presence to lead them into the land flowing with milk and honey? The Israelites were on the banks of the Jordan for three days before they crossed the river. And I have to wonder if in those three days, some of them tried to make their own way across. After all, the two spies who did reconnaissance on Jericho forded the river to get there and back. Maybe there were a few Israelites just testing the edges of the water, looking for a shallow crossing. Maybe they're gathering materials to start building a dam or a bridge or weaving rope to help them swim across. The Israelites were only human after all, and we humans really like to take control, even of our own salvation. For some of us, taking control means trusting our own effort more than we trust God's leading. Why wait for God to part the waters when I can build a boat myself? When Christ followers are relying on our own effort instead of on Christ, we try really hard to check off all the right things on our Christian to-do list. We commit to new habits and we grit our teeth in determination to just start doing that one thing and just stop doing those other things. We convince ourselves that if we just try hard enough, we can work ourselves up to being like Christ. And when we do that, following Christ feels like a burden instead of abundance, like wading across a flooded river instead of crossing on dry land. That's exactly how John Wesley felt. He's one of our ancestors in the faith, the way Abraham was an ancestor to the Israelites. He was a pastor in England in the 1700s, and he was doing all the right Christian things. He was a preacher. He visited people in prison. He got up early every day to study the Bible, and he even became a missionary for a while. And through all of that, he was plagued by doubt about whether he was trying hard enough. He had no confidence that he was really saved. Maybe if you've been a Christian for a while, you've felt that burden and doubt. John Wesley couldn't try himself into salvation. He had to trust God to create the way. So one evening, John went to a small group discussion that he didn't even want to be at, and while he was there, he's listening to this discussion leader read about the change God causes in people's hearts. And he felt his own heart grow warm. He wrote in his journal, I felt I did trust in Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. John Wesley came to trust in his soul what Paul wrote to the Ephesians. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves, it's the gift of God. Not by works, 
so that no one can boast. The Israelites could only enter the promised land because of God's presence represented in the Ark of the Covenant was going ahead of them to stop the river from sweeping them away. And we can only cross into the promised land of abundant life because Jesus has gone ahead of us into death and resurrection. So sin no longer sweeps us away. We cannot make our own way from death to life, from wandering to belonging, from the banks of the Jordan to the promised land. But maybe today, some of you are trying to. The good news for you this morning is you can turn from trying to trusting. If you have been trying to build your own boat or nearly drowning trying to cross the river into to abundant life through your own efforts, you can stop. Like the Israelites, you can look for the ark. Look to Christ. He's already held back the waters. All you have to do is trust that he fulfills the promise of abundant life. You can trust Christ to set you free from religious drudgery and trust him to lead you to the place where the opportunity for prayer and worship and time in scripture and biblical community are a gift. Jesus invites you to turn from trying to earn perfection to trusting him for transformation. Now, maybe some of the Israelites had the opposite reaction. Neither trying to cross the Jordan on their own, nor trusting God to lead them. Maybe some of them would have rather just settled where they were. Made a good enough home in a good enough spot. Contend not to deal with crossing the river at all, and indifferent to the joy awaiting them in the promised land. Maybe they were like the Israelites who complained to Moses when life in the wilderness got hard and they started saying they were better off when they were slaves in Egypt. Or maybe they're like the first round of spies who went to check out the promised land and reported back that it wouldn't be possible to possess it. They'd rather be in control of a good enough known than trust God for a better unknown. Some of us would rather be good enough than be like Christ. So we convince ourselves that all God wants for us is to be decent people, make good choices the majority of the time, be nice to the majority of people, be you know, generous when it doesn't cost us anything. We convince ourselves that the promised land is more like the good place. This mindset is captured perfectly in the first episode of the show, The Good Place. On the show, the recently deceased inhabitants of The Good Place watch an orientation video where an angelic manager explains why they are in The Good Place and not the other place. He says, you were all, simply put, good people. During your time on earth, every one of your actions had a positive or negative value depending on how much good or bad that action put out into the universe. When your time on earth has ended, we calculate the total value of our, your life using our perfectly accurate measuring system. Years ago, a team of sociologists studied the beliefs of Christian teenagers and they found the majority basically believed in a good place understanding of God's desire for us that all God wants for us is to be happy and moral people. The problem is, we can't be good. Not truly good on our own. We can be well-behaved. We can make moral choices a lot of the time. We can be kind or generous. We can exert willpower to overcome bad habits. But that doesn't get us across the river. That doesn't get us to abundant life. That might get us a decent tent to camp out in the wilderness. It might even help us forget that we're in the wilderness. But it doesn't change the reality. Trying to follow most of the rules most of the time is not the same as trusting Christ. Paul wrote about this problem to the church in Rome. He wrote, where then is boasting? It's excluded because of what law? 
the law that requires works? No, because the, of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith, apart from works of the law. Paul was explaining that people can know the moral law or the laws of God and try to follow them, but without faith in Jesus Christ, it can't get them anywhere. No one can make themselves righteous. But maybe today some of you are trusting yourself, trusting your decency or kindness or morality. Maybe you think all God wants for you is a good enough life in a good enough place. The good news for you this morning is God invites you from turn, to turn from trusting yourself to trusting God. You can turn from trusting yourself to be good to trusting Christ to make you holy. You can turn from trusting yourself to build a good enough life to trusting Christ for abundant life. You can turn from trusting yourself to willpower your way out of sin to trusting Christ to set you free from sin. You can turn from the wilderness to the river and trust God's presence to lead you across to the promised land. Then what? What comes after the decision to trust? The Lord does something amazing just like he promised. For the Israelites, that amazing thing happened this way. Yet as soon as the priests who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the waters from upstream stopped flowing. It piled up in a great heap a distance away at a town called Adam in the vicinity of Zarathon, while the water flowing down to the Sea of Arabah, that is the Red Sea, was completely cut off. So the people crossed over opposite Jericho. The priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all the Israelites passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. The Israelites trust God. They follow the Ark of the Covenant into the river and across it to the promised land. And that's the invitation God extends to us. If we trust God for abundant life now and glorious life in eternity, Christ has already cleared the way. Through his own death and resurrection, he holds back the waters that could drown us and calls us out of the wilderness into the promised land. When we have trusted God and crossed that river, there's one more thing the Israelites teach us to do. Joshua called together the 12 men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, go over before the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan. Each of you is to take up a stone on his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean? Tell them, the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. Joshua instructs the Israelite leaders to set up a monument that commemorates what God has done and that creates the opportunity to share that testimony with future generations who didn't experience it for themselves. First they trust, then they testify. It's the testimony, sharing the story again and again that reinforces the trust and passes that trust to others. Israelite identity depended on faithful retelling of the mighty acts of God, passing the faith from one generation to the next. That's what the Old Testament is, uh, the written testimony of how God worked among and through the Israelites, pointing toward the coming of the Messiah. They trusted God, and they testified about it. We don't enter the promised land alone, and we aren't content to leave others in the wilderness. Telling the story of trusting God reinforces our own trust and prepares others to trust as well. 
if we are in the promised land, we can declare with the author of Psalm 118, the Lord's right hand has done mighty things. The Lord's right hand is lifted high. The Lord's right hand has done mighty things. I will not die, but will live and proclaim what the Lord has done. What is your testimony of trusting God? When has God done an amazing thing in your life? What waters has Christ held back so you could cross on dry ground? What is your story, trusting Christ for abundant life or returning to life in Christ after wandering back to the desert for a while? Trust isn't a one-time decision, it's an ongoing choice. So what's your testimony today? What promises has God kept? What does the promised land look like for you? The Israelites set up a monument to create opportunities to remember their testimony and share it with others. If you were to set up a monument today, commemorating the mighty work of God, what story of trust in God would it memorialize? How would you tell the story to your children or friends if they asked what the monument meant? What would the monument be made of? The Israelites used stones from a river, but maybe yours is made of something else. Where would you build the monument? Maybe it would be in your home or school or office or car or a camp. As the band comes up, I want to invite you to use uh, the paper and pen at your seat. And take a few minutes to actually draw the monument that represents your testimony. And write down a little bit of the story it represents. Keep that drawing somewhere where you'll see it. If you're a better artist than I am, maybe you take it home and finish it or recreate it in a different form. If you've trusted Christ for the first time or in a new way this morning, testify about it. Share it with one of the pastors or a trusted friend. Today, we're invited to join the Israelites, trusting God and testifying about the amazing ways God keeps promises. Thank you for, uh, I'm so proud of you, Waterline, insert your name here, for the way that you're leaning into what God's inviting us to for the sense of his presence, from moving from a little church with a little bit of momentum to truly becoming a movement as we step in to steward his presence, as we lean into prayer, and as we understand what it is to have a relationship with God's word, an experiential relationship with the Holy Spirit, a life of prayer in the context of biblical community. Thank you for leaning into what God is doing. Can I pray as we leave? Father, we go today knowing that you make a way that your presence goes before us, that sometimes when circumstances look like they're going to drown us out, that your presence stops the water and gives us dry land. Give us patience, God, to learn what it means to go from trying to trusting. We'll give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Waterline, have a great week. I love you. I love you. I love you.